the jump from three to 12 or three to 10 was just too extreme of a jump. And so I guess from council's perspective or BCAP, they want to see a progressive increase. You are listening to the Property Developer Podcast, your home for tips, ideas and inspiration to help take your developing to the next level. Now here's your host, Justin Getty. Welcome back to the Property Developer Podcast, a show dedicated to helping developers take their business to the next level. I've got an interesting show for you today. We revisit a discussion with previous guest, John Marquez, to discuss how he went at the local planning tribunal. John had a planning application for 10 units knocked back by council, so he decided to ask the independent umpire to review his application. His insights and lessons are an invaluable chance to hear what happens when a planning application doesn't go your way. Before we get to John, I'm pleased to say our 20-unit townhouse development has now sold out. We made three quick sales in the past two weeks, which helped us across the line. We republished a premiere listing on realestate.com.au which brought our project back to the top of the suburb search list and resulted in some fresh inquiries and signatures on contracts. Once we got down to the last few townhouses, the power of scarcity and sense of urgency encouraged buyers to make a decision. It was a strange feeling selling out. After more than a year of thinking about sales and marketing, it's like a piece of me has disappeared. I thought we might have some stock left over come completion, but it seems not. They were all taken. Now I'm focusing on finding that next site and keeping construction on track. In the next episode, I will share with you my reflections about what I've learned along the way up to this point. Now, on to today's show. We speak with former guest John Marquez about his proposed 10-unit development. His planning application was refused by the local council following a lot of objections from the neighbours. He then decided to take his case to the local independent planning tribunal called VCAT have it reviewed by an independent and impartial umpire. The result of the hearing surprised John's team and today he shares what happened and the impact of the decision. This is a really good discussion around what to do when council mucks you around and forces you to change direction. I kicked off the discussion by asking John what he would eat until he was sick. (laughs) I had a funny feeling you'd have another one. Um, Probably mangoes. Um... No, I, I, no, I don't think there's a food that, that I can eat that constant. But um, yeah, we'll say mango for now. I love them, but I haven't eaten them to the extent where I felt that I wouldn't be able to see another one for the rest of my life. Really? No favourite foods that you just get stuck right into? Oh, there is, but oh, okay. Um, <laughs> let's say a nice roast. A nice roast. Nice lamb roast with rosemary. Before we eat that, <laughs> it'd be the last request on Beth Road. <laughs> I know I've eaten some roast lamb until I felt a bit unwell, so I can understand that. Now, John, it's been a little while since we first spoke. You were one of the first guests on the Property Developer Podcast, and during our discussion, we talked about how one of your 10 unit sites was looking likely to be heading to VCAT or you were waiting to go to VCAT? That's correct, yep. And eventuated that we did go to VCAT. Yep, so you did go to VCAT and you've now heard back about how you went at the tribunal. So I thought it would be a good time to check back in with you and find out how it all went. What can you share with us? Maybe you can start off by giving us a bit of background about the site for people that may not have listened in and... um, and where you were at and what's happened. Yep, okay, so I'll rewind uh, back a little for those that um, didn't listen to the first podcast. We're predominantly developing in the eastern suburbs, so the areas of Croydon, Little Bark, so, you know, 30, 40, 30, 40 kilometres east from Melbourne. They're the suburbs that we're predominantly um, developing in. Um, this one in particular felt under the shire of the Yarra Ranges. Now we purchased this site during the transition stage where um, there was a lot of change going on to the councils, to the councils on the new zonings. Um, we felt um, we found an opportunity to buy something which not many others were aware of what we could do with this site. So, well, that was a great opportunity. Uh, being a trailblazer also has its um, negative impact. So 
Um, we purchased this site and we were we engaged with council right from the start and we were, you know, we got good feedback at the start on what we could do with this site as far as um, the density. This was under, um, uh, had a DDOA, it was uh, close to the activity centre of Moorbark and it had a DDOA which is a uh, development overlay. Um, so it was a 2,400 square metre site, wasn't it? At 2,200, 2,200 square metre site. So, Back then, we, our first assessment from our draft year was that we can probably get nine units on there. So we approached council for an over-the-counter meeting chat to see what they thought. And they felt that the density wasn't high enough based on the fact that um, it did have a, a density overlay. So we decided to have a mud map drawn up and increase it by two. So we went back and had a council meeting at 11. They still felt that um, the density wasn't high enough. So, and because they wouldn't really tell us, they couldn't put a number on how many. We just thought we'd um, really prop it up, and then it would be easy for them to then knock it back, saying, you know, the density was too high. So we we then proposed fourteen, which they weren't happy with, due to the design being quite spread out on the site and close to the boundaries, and they just felt there was too much driveway and. So that gave us indication of what the maximum was that they would be happy with. So having said that, we um, they did give us some sort of insight into another site where they felt that um, a central driveway with units to each side would probably have a good outcome. So we did that. We met up with them, and they were quite happy with our design. So now we're at the 12-unit design, um, central driveway, six units on each side. Um, so we went forth with that and everything was going fine. We uh, even managed to snap up a few pre-sales before getting the permit. It was around this time that um, residents on the street, now I, I need to point out that it, this is in a court scenario, so you'll see how this impacted later. Um, so you went to advertising? Went to advertising and the residents caught wind of what was happening and they started inquiring and obviously uh, they would have been notified at some stage also and they um, joined forces and um, challenged us or approached council informing them that they were going to um, object, which they did. So from council supporting our 12 unit design to council uh, doing a backflip and then opposing us and wanting us to, from that stage onwards to reduce the density and reduce it to an extent where we felt that we didn't know why there was the why the you know the street was zoned by density if council were uh, pushing us to a level where the density wasn't even a factor or wasn't even considered. Um, we took on board their feedback, which was to um, create, to have bigger setbacks, because this also had an SLO, which is a significant land overlay, which where you need to respect... Um, uh, landscape, sorry, significant yeah. landscape overlay. Yeah. And so we went back to the drafty with the design and they also wanted to see separation in the build form this is something that was never brought up but um obviously i guess it was council's way of indirectly telling us they want to reduce the amount of um dwellings on the site so this so, is a funny part of the site as well because it has a, a a higher density overlay and also a land significant landscape overlay so they want higher density but lots of, of trees and vegetation yeah, the two contradict each other, absolutely. So when it comes to, we're not, we weren't aware of this at that time, but it, it seems that um, it depends which one they place the mo most emphasis on will, you know, will depend on which way this is all going to go. So um, we created a separation in the build form, and the only way to do that was to drop another two units. So now we we're at 10 units and we've created, say, four blocks of units with um, separation between the blocks, two blocks on each side, 
and we meant and we put the visit car parks in there uh, to try and um, make the you know utilize that space some in some way. Which is a bit contradictory to what they have in the design in the schedule in the in their planning schedule where it says they want to consolidate build form. Yeah, look, absolutely, and and which is what they asked me to do because I my development was in the same area as yours, so they asked us to consolidate the built form. Yeah, look, absolutely, and and we used your site as an example, but they just felt um, there's a difference between a site being on a main road and a site being in a court where there wasn't many other developments in the area, so they, they took consideration of what was around, which, you know, according to our planner and our draft here, uh, would not impact in any way on what we were trying to achieve. So I guess it got to the stage that then when we did produce the 10 unit design, they were still not happy and they felt that um, we still needed, uh, it was still a little visual bulky and by that stage the objectors were making quite a bit of noise and so council, I guess, took their took their side and we had no other option but to, to take it to VCAP because the whole process was dragging too much. and. Up to that stage, we'd have listened to council and it gotten us nowhere. So, uh, through the advice of our planner, we went forward and applied for a VCAT hearing. So, that was six months wait for the VCAT hearing and then another six weeks wait for a decision. So, it's a lengthy process, seven and a half months. Um, we went in there quite confident. Um, we were very confident, our planner and our drafters were very confident on the design we had and that we'd adhered to everything that council was wanting. Um, in the end, the decision didn't go our way. They, um, they felt that um, due to the fact that it's on the court, in the court, we didn't really respect the neighbourhood character of the court. And so, I mean, there's not, there are other smaller developments on the court two and three unit sites but nothing to the to the density that we were proposing they felt that there was too much of a jump from what was there to what we were trying to achieve on the site um, they felt that the build form wasn't uh, that the build form was unbroken and the setbacks were still too minimal uh, the design density was still too high um, and we didn't respect the neighbourhood character. So a combination of all that, plus the bill form, you know, with that goes the fact that in their eyes, the bill form was um, too bulky. And uh, we weren't consistent with the sense of openness that the street or that the court had. So it's not what we expected. We, we thought we'd um, done enough homework to go in there confident that we were, at the worst case scenario, going to get a, a positive outcome with maybe possible conditions um, on the permit. But um, yeah, it wasn't to be. And as I said, we, we didn't just consult with our planner and our drafter. We had an external, another external planner give us feedback and we had spoken to quite a few others. And everyone was quite, uh, quite positive of um, the outcome going our way, but so it wasn't to be. So um, it was devastating, but um, we've come to realise that uh, there's so much grey area, that um, and you know subjective view of the, the person chairing the VCAT hearing that um, yeah. Yeah, I was talking to uh, an architect a couple of episodes ago, Dominic Serantonio, and I had mentioned to him that I just found out about the outcome from your case and how neighbourhood character was such an important part of the decision making for the member. And he said, yep, yeah, it's really important. Neighbourhood character is really, really important. So, was, which surprised me. I probably wouldn't have thought in that, in your instance, in that area, Given that there was a higher density overlay, the neighbourhood character would still sort of trump everything else. But it seems it does. Well, 
I mean, we, we were up of the understanding that um, this is all part of the change that they wanted for the activity centre. Um, and so we felt that they were going to have more emphasis on what they're wanting and not what was existing. And, you know, as it came to be, they felt that we failed to respect their existing and preferred neighbourhood character. I guess um, reflecting back when we spoke to our uh, planner after the hearing, he said if there had been other developments already in that court that were of a high density that's already there, then it wouldn't be too much of a jump from what was there to what we're proposing. But to have, you know, say, for example, a, a the highest densities or the maximum builds, buildings on a site, say, three units, to jump from three to 12 or three to 10 was just too extreme of a jump. And so I guess I guess from council's perspective or BCAP, they want to see, I guess, a progressive increase Rather than, and there is another. There, there, what there are, there is, there are a couple of other blocks on that street that um, have been purchased by developers uh, with the intention of doing the same level of density as ours. And they're now probably, they're probably feeling a bit nervous. Well, we've basically set a precedence now. Our this our VCAT hearing um, or decision has set the precedence now. So yeah, they're all nervous and they're not sure. Whether they should challenge this, it could be a matter of um, getting a different chairperson with uh, a different view to the whole to the whole thing about density and neighbourhood character. Um, you know, the facts remain: we're still at the same proximity as you are from, from the activity centre, from the station, and from, from the shopping precinct. So, I mean, if you look at Murrell Park as a suburb. Where we are is a very close proximity to the rest of Mill Park. I mean, Mill Park can really stretch to a distance where it's quite far from the station and the shops and all that, very far removed. So we're quite close to all that. So again, we were confident on the fact that um, being close and also the fact that our planner felt at the hearing that um, if, if council was going to view it this way, then they had plenty of opportunity to remove that street from, from being a high density street. But the fact that they didn't, we felt suggested that um, it would be okay for us to build at the same density. I mean, we're not that far. We're only a street away from from uh, a 79 unit site. I know, that's a crazy thing. So, you know, that's such an extreme uh, difference in uh, density that uh, I, I just really believe that um, being the reasons people buy in a court are different to what people buy in the street, and so they just viewed the court differently. It's it's a different environment, a court to a street where you've got through traffic. So, but you know, these are things that, for whatever reason, our planner or drafter did not take into consideration. They just felt that um, the DDR weight was the the king, but uh, no. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience of going through to the tribunal and being at the tribunal? How does it feel being there and what gets presented? How does it sort of work? When we arrived there, really it's, you just got the, the chairman of the tribunal, then you have the representatives for both parties. So in our case, it was our planner representing us and then there was myself and my business partner, that was our group. Then and the other group you had council. So on their on their side, they had a council representative, and there were three objectors that um, rolled up. Um, uh, basically, the way the hearing started was um, they elected or they were told to go first. So um, basically, each of the objectors got a got a time slot to um, express their concerns and put uh, forward um, any issues they saw with uh, the proposed our proposed development and then council uh, the council representative got to say um, got to express his uh, views so that took the hearing started about 10 that took probably an hour and a half just to get through that and then um, 
we had a bit of a break and we came back and then from our team we also had a landscape planner who was there to basically we knew that there was going to be quite a few questions put forward about um, setbacks and um, landscaping um, uh, trees species height tree heights of trees how the trees would um, break the build form um, along the front and those sort of questions so <coughs> he gave his presentation on uh, what we propose as far as tree plantings you know canopy trees along the front uh, shrubberies around the side all natives uh, all the, the ones along the front would be faster growing uh, canopy trees within five years they would basically break the whole build form along the front so it would be quite um, hidden away and won't be as um, uh, bulky looking I guess you could say um, so his presentation was lasted for about an hour and um, because the hearing was they they the, the hearing was booked for half a day so we didn't get time to uh, put our case forward so that was scheduled for another date so a week later uh, we had the second hearing and that one basically comprised of us or our planner giving our side of the story we felt uh, that our planner gave a good presentation we felt that um, that he answered um, all the questions that were posed to him so we really we walked out of there feeling confident that um, we were going to have um, a good result so at the end of the hearing we were basically told that uh, it would take four or six weeks to get a response or um, a decision made the the chairperson uh, would need to uh, suggest that she was going to do a site visit and a walk to the site from the station just to get a feel of uh, proximity to the station because uh, this site being up on a hill uh, she wanted to see how much of a challenge because it was put forward by a few of the objectors that um, it would be a bit of a challenge for an elderly person let alone a middle-aged person to um, get to the street or get to the court from from the shop so they just felt that although it was within proximity of the station and shops I think it was 750 meters or a bit further to the station they just felt because of the undulating land topography that um, it was actually quite a challenge so they just felt that it was um, yeah they just didn't feel that um, it was uh, appropriate appropriate to have a, um, a street or court like that um, as part of the activity center I guess yeah, because you're on top of a hill, a small hill, really, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. So, or a, a rise. Yeah, so, I mean, we're probably the same proximity to the station that you are. The only difference is uh, ours is a bit more of a steep climb, that's right. And they just, we didn't think that they, that um, the chairperson would put much weight on that argument, but she actually, when she said that she was actually going to take that walk to see how it, um how steep it was or how challenging it would be and as part of the report she did say that um although we are a close proximity because of the fact that it is on a bit of a hill and you know a bit of a windy hill to get up that um in a way it felt that it was far removed so she still accepted the fact that we were close and it was close she acknowledged that but um yeah still felt that um it was a bit of a hidden away pocket and uh, therefore it, she didn't feel it should be viewed as if it was on a flat road that led all the way to the station as in your site say which is the exact same distance same overlays same zoning exactly the same except yours on the main road yeah so what would you say the lessons are that you've learnt now that you've had a little bit of time to stop and reflect on what's happened I can't say we didn't put enough effort into putting forward a case 
or putting forward the best case possible. As I said, we spent quite a bit of time. We engaged with council before we even purchased the site to get an understanding of where they stood with, with the site or what we could do with the site. We engaged with the planner, a private planner, our drafty throughout the whole process, and then we got external um, feedback from third party planner. Um, so I, I can't say that that was that was a downfall of what has happened. Having said that, the decision was so far fetched from what we thought we were going to get that um, that struck me as odd to think that we spent so much time and money in getting professionals involved to get you know a decision that was so far removed from what we thought we were going to get. I haven't spoken to, as I said, a few planners in getting um, getting all that feedback. No one ever came back with anything that was contradictory to what our planner had told us. So they were all on the same page when it came to how they felt about us going forward to VCAT, and that was that they all had a very positive feel that we were going to get um, the outcome that we were looking at getting. So, you know, our 80 to 90% chance, basically, we were given. So I think that um, it, it all falls down to either the uh, subjective view of the chairperson. We were told that um, you could end up with someone that's a bit more pro-development or others that aren't. So I think that sort of may have some bearing on it. And I think also... I think the biggest lesson we learned is not to take anything in isolation. So you have to take a view of, you have to look at the whole picture. You, you can't just say it's a DDOA, therefore I can do whatever I want. And I think that was the biggest lesson. You need to respect the, the, the zonings, the overlays, and take them in context of where the site is located. I mean, if we pick up that site and move it to the next street down, we probably would have... Um, We'd probably be building 12 units right now. But um, the fact is, it's in a court. You have to respect what's around you. It's a different situation in a court than it is on a main road or on a side street. And so you need to take everything into consideration and not anything in isolation. And I think that was the biggest um, the biggest learning I can take away from all this. Um, I, I'm not sure if anybody should have made us aware or whether our planet or draft should have been aware of any of this. But... Uh, it's it's a lesson there, um, yeah. So, is there anything that you would do differently? Part of, I mean, I know you, you, mean you just talked about context, taking into account context, but there is there anything else that you might do differently? I think the fact that, um, regardless of the outcome, I think we could have shortened the whole period, and that is, we probably should have. Um, place more emphasis on what uh, our planner was telling us. He, he told us much earlier in the process that council was going to uh, lead us on a wild goose chase. We felt that um, we could work with council because they did at the start mention that they were willing to work with us. We were sort of guinea pigs in the fact that we were the first to be doing, you know, we were one of the first, as yourself, uh, to do a, a, a development or a large development since the zoning had come in. So we were going to be, in a way, seen, you know, uh, as guinea pigs. And we were happy with that as long as they were willing to work with us. But the fact is that um, uh, as soon as the objectors come on board, they probably felt that uh, they should, you know, take their side because it's them that elects them into power. So um, we could have probably shortened the whole period by having uh, this made a decision to go to VCAT earlier. The outcome probably would have been the same, but that's fine because um, it, it is what it is. I'm not sure. Oh, we still don't know how we could have um, come up with a come up with a more positive uh, response from VCAT. So I guess it's just a bit of a little unfortunate to the fact that uh, when the new zoning is coming, council was lost as to what we could do there. Probably our planner and our drafty. And what advice would you have for other developers who may be in a similar situation with a council that's maybe dragging their feet or unsure about what's possible on a site? The fact is that 
from the first person we spoke to council to then, you know, the third and fourth person, we were just getting different answers. So I feel that um, you need to speak to people that are qualified. Now, I'm not sure when you first find a site and you want to meet with council, uh, senior planners don't like to deal with developers. Um, but I feel that uh, you really need to speak to someone that really knows uh, their stuff because if you're going to be dealing with uh, planners that um, aren't well in tune with what's going on, then you may be led on a gun, you know, the wrong gun path. So I think that from the onset, you just need to make sure that whoever you're speaking to in council um, is someone with a, you know good authority and really understands um, what they're going. Otherwise, it's just a big waste of time for everybody. And I guess that's the same for your team members, as in your planner and your drafty. You need to make sure that they're well rehearsed. And ours were well rehearsed with that council, well rehearsed with what's going on in that area. And um, I felt that maybe if we'd spoken to council members, that um, to planners and council that were more switched on, maybe we could have come to this conclusion much earlier on in the process rather than two years later, we're still back to square one. Okay, and what now? Okay, so we've had time to um, regroup and meet with our planner and, and drafter. We, we're proposing now uh, to drop a couple more units and um, have a council meeting with a senior planner and see what they think of our new eight unit design. I think the positive that's come out of all this is there has been growth in the property market and so there's still a reasonable profit left in there for us to go in there with an eight unit design. So again, I've, you know, if this was done at the wrong phase of a property cycle, it could probably put you in a pretty awkward situation. And so we, we, we're lucky that um, we've had enough growth to be able to say that we can still, with an eight unit design, although it wasn't our original intention, that we can still um, go through with the development and come out with quite a reasonable profit margin. Yes, that is a very fortunate situation to be in because you'd hate to be looking at a couple hundred thousand dollar loss. Yeah, no doubt there's others there that have been through that. Uh, yeah, and you, you'd be scratching your head thinking you've done everything you could and yet how did you end up in this uh, situation? And, and I'd be feeling the same way. I, I'd say I'd understand if I cut corners, wasn't prepared to pay for quality um, consultants, but uh, we did all that. So, yeah, you'd be devastated, I think. You'd be devastated. Yeah. But it just goes to show the nature of, of, um, of developing that, um, yeah, you just got to take what comes your way and try and um, make the best of it. Now that you've got a few more battle scars, have you got any or a tip for developers out there, something that you've learnt along the way? I guess it'd be, again, on um, your team. Make sure you've got the best team available. Um, don't skip on your team. I mean, their information is their information's invaluable, um, especially when it comes to situations like this where, where you're being challenged by council or whoever it may be. So, yeah, look, don't be afraid of, of, of these challenges. I think you grow uh, exponentially with these uh, challenges. You learn much more. We're, we're well rehearsed in BCAT now, so if it ever happened again, um, I think we'd be much better equipped to, um, to deal with. And, um, yeah, we'd be in a better positive frame of mind to um, take the challenge on. So with your application for the eight unit site, that's a completely fresh application now, isn't it? It is, although um, we're not going to hold them to it, but uh, they have mentioned that they could, that they would fast track it. <laughs> so I know, I know. <laughs> I wouldn't I know, be we've all my breath on that one. <laughs> I know, and, and again, I mean. Well, your idea, my idea of fast tracking and a council's idea of fast tracking, I think are slightly different. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, Look, I agree. I'd, I'd probably take the same view that um, I'd have to plan for this to take as long again as it has. Um, 
the planning process that is. So, yeah, look, you're absolutely right. It's, I guess, two years on, it, 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 it just feels like we just uh, bought the site and we're just starting our first application. So, yeah, it's unfortunate. But as I said, the market's still uh, relatively strong. So, we still mentally, we're still in a good place. Um, yeah, so we're looking forward to it. And what else have you got going on? Can you update us on your other larger site that you had in the neighbouring suburb? Yeah, so we've got another site. Uh, again, under the same council, the Arrow Rangers, different suburb, um, same same overlays. Um, so again, uh, high density overlay, same zoning. So everything exactly the same as this site. The only difference is a different suburb, and this is in a street. Um, this is further removed from the activity centre, but our our planner strongly feels that um, we won't have the same challenges that we had with this current site due to the fact that we're not in the court uh, and the fact that there's already quite a few sites that have been developed on the street. So I guess you could say the neighbourhood character is different to what it is on our current site, on, on this site that we just um, had the BCAT hearing for. So we're proposing 10. Um, we're shortly going to be having a meeting with council to just get their feedback on on how they feel about this and whether, you know, whether the decision we've just had with our current site has set any precedence for that site because, you know, it's under the same shire, everything's, everything's uh, the same, the, except this is in the street now and we've already some density. So it would be interesting to see if uh, they again put emphasis on neighbourhood character. Neighbourhood character is different now in, in this street. So it would be an interesting conversation. Um, well, you'd have to take anything they say with a grain of salt, given that they strongly supported your original application and had their fingerprints all over the design. Yeah, look, absolutely. And um, our, uh, I will say that our planner is very confident with our current 10 unit design. Our draft feels that um, we may have to revisit that design. Uh, he feels that um, the precedence that has been set by our current site may impact on uh, what we do there. So it'll be interesting. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, councils beyond this. But um, again, this time we won't be playing the same game. Uh, once we feel that councils start um, turning their back on us, we'll just um, if we need to get a VCAT, we'll, it's better to go sooner than later. Uh, yeah, but we, we strongly feel that this one is, is a different kettle of fish, and so we won't have the same challenges. But again, you know, um, I don't think the, the the objecting group will be as strong because there's nothing there that they really need to protect. There's already quite a few developments on the street, whereas in a court, it's a different environment. And the fact that everyone's, it's more of a close-knit community in a court, and so they really... Uh, they really group together, um, yeah. And I don't think you have these um, these uh, sort of groups as as closely together in a street. All right. Well, I hope your application goes a lot more smoothly on that site. And thanks for being so generous with updating us on how you went with VCAT. Thank you once again for being on the Property Developer Podcast. Thanks, Justin. I look forward to um, probably have another po podcast in the future and uh, talk about um, how we've gone with our next site. Yeah, you can tell us how you got your planning permit really easily this time. That'd be great. <laughs> All right, Not John. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. See ya. Bye. Okay, there you have it. A stark example of the ups and downs of property development. Sometimes, despite your strongest beliefs, things don't go your way. I'm very grateful to John for sharing that overview with you as a lot of people wouldn't be so forthcoming after a loss at a tribunal. As always, there are some good lessons from John's experience that we can all learn from. The points I took out of it are 1. Have a contingency plan in place. 
Nobody likes to think they are going to lose a hearing or have their application refused, but you need to be prepared for that happening. What is your fallback plan for if that happens? Are you going to head to a tribunal or independent umpire? Are you going to change your design? Or are you going to exit the project? Maybe it is all three in that order. Whatever it is, be ready to put it into play. 2. Hire the best people for the job. This may sound obvious, but when you have your back up against a wall, you need to know that you have the very best people around you helping you. This is where doing good due diligence on your team members before you engage them is so important. Ask around for who the best external town planner is for that local area or council. Get them to review your initial application to see whether they think it will get through. Make sure you hire a designer who understands what council is looking for and how best to present your application if you are pushing the boundaries a bit. Chewing up time and money on delays getting your planning approval is a profit killer and energy drainer. I should know, I've been there. 3. Stay focused on your ultimate objective. Challenges and setbacks are just part of the process with property developing. You can't let them defeat you or stop you from progressing. You need to stay focused on what you are trying to achieve with your developing. For each project, that may be around getting it done with a certain profit level or margin, or within a certain time frame. Or over your career, producing high quality developments that stand out. Whatever it is, stay focused and see things on the way, not in the way. This will help smooth out the bumps and jumps along the way. That's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed that peek behind the curtain of what happens when a planning decision doesn't go your way. Please head over to iTunes and leave us a rating or drop by the website propertydeveloperpodcast.com and comment on the show. And thanks again for listening in. Until next time, may all your planning applications be speedily approved. You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com.